question. Do you remember where you were on the morning of Sunday, 1st of September, 1997? No? What if I mention the Place Dalma underpass? Dodi Fayed, Henri Paul, and Trevor Reese jones Got it now? Good. Well, in tonight's show, I'll be talking with a very special guest, an investigative journalist and co-author of a controversial book on the death of Princess Diana on that summer night in Paris in 1997. It's called Princess Diana, The Evidence. My guest is John King. What a show we've got tonight. John, welcome. Hi. I'm going to show the camera your book before we start. This is, this is um, John's book. If you can zoom in on that a bit. Look at that. And I'm not moving it around tonight. <laughs> so, um, John, how on earth did you get involved in writing this book? Well, yeah, it's quite a story, really. Um, I mean, there are two. Uh, first of all, a bit about my background. I, I happened to grow up in Sandhurst on the Surrey Berkshire border where the RMA, the Royal Military Academy, mm -hmm. is where um, uh, Princes William and Harry recently trained. Uh, but all around there, I mean, there, there's all the shot is just down the road. It's known as the home of the British Army. Um, and for about a 30, 40 mile radius all around that area, it's, it's pretty much all military. Uh, or um, top secret uh, research and development uh, facilities, etc. MOD compounds, and there's also um, uh, a kind of an unofficial private security firm that that, that worked out of Sandhurst a, a lot in the 70s and 80s, particularly as I was growing up there. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, these guys were 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 basically hired by MI6 to go out to places like Angola, interestingly, and this is what it's leading to, really, where Diana's landmines campaign was focused. So just by coincidence, I just happened to know these guys, or I knew their families. The Sanders was a very small little village in those days. I either knew them or I, or I knew their brothers or went to school with their brothers. And a lot of what they did, although you would think it was probably quite, you know, secret or top secret missions they were going on you know it was it was a, a small town mentality in Sandhurst and a lot of things was, was spoken about so so even though it was supposed to be secret what they were doing they would talk to their friends and presumably if you were one of their friends they would talk to you a little bit is well yeah and when I got old enough to you know go, go to the pub and things it, you'd be surprised the, the, the things that were spoken about quite openly actually so anyway the, the point being that I happen to know these guys, I happen to know a lot about, through, through knowing them, what actually was going on in Angola and what was really going on behind the scenes there. Um, so I knew, I knew all these, these guys who were either former SAS guys or, or some other elite force, special, special forces uh, personnel, or attached to uh, some or other security or intelligence unit and hired by MI6 to do these, the British government's dirty work, basically. So that's one side, I just wanted to, to put that in perspective there. On the other side, at the time um, that Diana was killed, I mean, firstly, I mean, Diana at that time was really not on my radar. I, I, I was aware of her, obviously, yeah, everybody how was. How could you not but, be, yes. Yeah, but I mean, not in the sense of, you know, I wasn't a Diana fan or anything of that nature. Um, but I was, um, at the time, I was an editor of uh, um, an X-File kind of magazine in Britain, a high street magazine, was doing quite well at the time because the X-Files itself was massive at that time back in the 90s. The mm. whole UFO and cover-up scenario was huge, it was a, 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 a huge like, resurgence of interest in, in that whole area at yes. that time. So um, I was editing a magazine at the time called UFO Reality. Uh, but my main area of interest was the cover-up side of things and, and my regular contribution, or I did a lot, but my regular contrib contribution each, each issue was John King's x file document, which was basically investigating various areas of the alleged government cover-up uh, on that side of things. And at that time as well, I know it sounds a bit odd now, but putting it back into context, at that time, uh, in the 90s, there was a lot of interest in, in what was going on. For, you know, the various intelligence agencies were showing a fairly healthy interest in 
you know, the UFO phenomenon, even the crop circle phenomenon. You know, the the mm. CIA and British intelligence were wondering, you know, is it aliens or is it the Russians? They've got some new technology going on here or something, you know. Back to crop circles so, again. We had a well, program on that very recently. But. Really? Okay. So anyway, coming to the point, uh, through that, uh, in those investigations as well, uh, I, I got to know a few people who claim to be very, uh, working in various areas of the government, interested in various aspects of this whole phenomenon that seemed to be happening in those days. And to cut to the quick, uh, I was made aware of some information. I'm not saying exactly where this information came from right now, but it was, it was within this circle of people I've just uh, explained. Yes. Uh, of of uh, a high-level assassination. Uh, was in the air. You were now, told that there was going to be a very assass high level assassination. Yes, yeah. And this is before the death of Diana. Before the death of Diana, how, yeah. How long before the death of Diana? About a week. And they said it was going to be, what, within a week or something like that? Shortly, yeah. No, no definite time span was put on it. There was no name given, obviously. But there was, you know, it's, I know it sounds, whatever it sounds like, but just, you know, I'm trying to put things in context of, of knowing the people that I happen to know through growing up with them, or the things they were involved in, you know, uh, it's all it's all documented. They're named in the book. It's yes. not something I'm making these people up. Well, you, you know, haven't said who, who told you that information, though, have you? No, the one the one person that I say told me that particular piece of information is named Stealth in the book because that was his cover name. He was known as Stealth. I've written about him a lot in the in, in my other book as well, in Cosmic Top Secret. And in the magazine, he was a, a regular kind of, or became, became quite a good source of information. Now, I've read this book, and actually yeah. it is a really good book. I mean, it's fascinating from start to finish. Um, and in it, you say that when he told you this, that he said to you that this death, this assassination, would be bigger than JFK. Yeah, that's right. Bigger than Kennedy. And there aren't many, are Quite. there? There aren't many that could potentially be bigger than JFK. In the no. event, I think probably... It probably was, or as big as yeah. JFK. Yeah, and in the cold light of day, it's easy. In, uh, and with hindsight, you know, you can look back and think, well, yeah, well, that was obvious then, wasn't it? But you, you know, didn't work it out, didn't did, put it, did two you? Two together. But you, again, it's just putting things in context. Again, you know, as I say, if you if you'd have been in in the pubs in those days, listening to the way these guys talked to each other about what they've been doing and, and, and what they're involved in, that kind of brag, that kind of boast, was fairly natural it, you know so when someone says it was is going to be bigger than Kennedy yeah that was a quote but it wasn't likely to be true the same then, time you, you know well I didn't take it as, as, as I, I didn't take it with a pinch of salt exactly but I certainly didn't take it that seriously knowing the kind of characters these guys are but, but once once Diana's death occurred a week later then I suppose in a sense you'd fallen down the rabbit hole hadn't you you were uh, you couldn't ignore what you'd been told, is, am no, I right in that? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So where did that leave you? I mean, where, what did you do then? Well, uh, yeah, well, for the first little while, it was, it was a very tr tricky time, to, to, to be honest, you know. I mean, it was, it was uh, the, first, the first thing I did, uh, once, once that I'd realised that this really could be what this guy had been talking about. There was still no definite proof. I still can't prove that this is what the man was talking about, but it's, you know, it seems I won't ever believe otherwise, personally. Nice. Um, so I started looking at it. I started asking a few questions and look, I mean, the whole world, well, it seemed at that time, was thinking, at the very least, there's something quite not right about this. You know, so many people thought that she died in extremely, you know, um, suspicious circumstances, should we say, at least. So. There was a lot of a lot of information was was coming at us through the media and, and various other you know channels on the internet I suppose or just beginning on the internet. So it was a question of just beginning to to, to look at uh, what was happening and, and ask a few questions. I, I went to talk to a couple of people that I knew. Everything that I've been told by stealth was kind of reiterated and confirmed by the other people I was talking to. Um, and the more I looked into it, I, I was joined eventually by my associate editor at the time, John Beveridge, who helped me out with the investigation. He's your co-author on this book as well, co isn't he? Researcher and co-author on yeah. the book, yeah. 
who was a hardened sceptic to start with. Uh, you know, he really, really thought this, I was wasting my time, it was an accident. He wasn't aware of what uh, Stealth had told me before, because I didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we just st I started looking around, I started to ask some questions, and before long it started to look to me very much, regardless of what I'd been told, that there were a lot of questions that s needed some serious answers, you know, uh, surrounding Diana's death and the circumstances in which she died. And I just found myself being more and more drawn into it. And uh, I contacted also my agent at the time, my literary agent, just thinking that you know, I didn't know who else knew that I had met this guy more than once. And I didn't know who else knew what he told me. I, I started to get, a, you know, I suppose, <laughs> veering towards you know paranoia paranoid about this because i didn't know who else knew that he that, that we'd met i didn't know who else knew because of his claimed situation where he you know who he's working for so i contacted my do you agent. know who he's working for he said he was a cia cia uh, asset yeah okay. yeah former um american special forces uh, vet veterans and, and okay. Uh, and so that's what I did. I, I, I'm kind of reliving it now, and it's, it's, it, I was just I confused that, yeah. and, and concerned. <clears throat> uh, and so within, because it's what I do, I'm a writer, so I thought the only thing I can really do now is look to perhaps writing something about this, and that very soon turned into, well, it has to be a book, I contacted my literary agent at the time, who was um, who was my former editor at Hodder and Stoughton, who, who did, did the other book. And we we met up in London with, with John Beveridge as well. And uh, yeah, he thought it was a good idea. We should do that. We should get it out there because that might be a way of you know, I don't know. It was just it seemed the the, the thing to do, the natural thing to do. And um, <clears throat> yeah, he. Uh, well, he, he, he had publishing houses crawling over him for the story. Uh, we, we had meetings with the managing directors, not, not the commissioning editors, you know, of, of their various, uh, Jonathan Cape was involved, um, Simon and Schuster were gagging for it. But within a few weeks, it was like, no. So we can't do this book, we can't do this book, we can't do this book. Well, it's interesting, because one of the questions I first text I got, actually, Paul in Warrington. Hello again, Paul. Uh, why did they block the publishing of the book in the UK if it wasn't a conspiracy? Well, this is, yeah, exactly that. So we, we struggled and struggled to, to find anywhere to publish it. You know, I was, I'm not Stephen King or whatever, but, uh, uh, you know... But it was I, a strong story and they were all bidding for it and then suddenly... Well, I was a published author, you know, with a reputable company and I was editor of the magazine and, you know, I, I wasn't unknown. Is what I'm saying. So but it wasn't about the quality of the writing. For it instance. was about a cover-up. I am absolutely convinced about that now. Right. I was not so convinced then, although I was wondering what on earth was going on and why we were being wined and dined one minute and then the next minute. You were, you were and there's the a lot door. More, there's a, there, there are a lot more stories we might touch upon tonight uh, uh, in that same regard. How we were absolutely kind of gagged silenced and uh, even when the book came over the distribution was was very difficult very, very difficult. difficult but it is available isn't it now this uh, yeah. princess diana the evidence yeah so okay having been told a week in advance something obviously you can't prove is not a book is it so you know you obviously were doing research with yeah. your co-author with um, john beveridge um you know let's line up the ducks what did you discover that that got you, you know, on this road to this book. You know, what were the things that I know you were able to talk to other security intelligence people about yeah. methods that might have been used. I mean, do you want to talk about that for a bit? Yeah, well, I, yeah, uh, it might be good to kind of take a kind of chronological uh, okay. line, if you like. Yeah, because, no, absolutely. Uh, Let's do that. One, one of the things uh, that the first person I spoke to, I spoke to three people in particular after Diana's death that were, um, well, I'll say, I'll say that, I've, I didn't name them before, but <clears throat> they're I kind of identified in this, but one 
worked for the government, is all I can say. One was an MI5 officer serving, and the other worked for another military intelligence department of the government. I know that for a fact. Those three characters in the book have become a kind of composite, in a way, of information that's presented in the book in order to preserve their anonymity. Okay. But what I learned from those three sources, one in particular actually, but those three sources, I was introduced to one of them by another one anyway, so there's two effectively, was a kind of a timeline of what was going on um, in terms of motive for Diana's death leading up to the crash. This is why I'm so convinced that, that she was assassinated. Uh, we were told, or I was told, uh, initially what I was told, and then John and I were told that um, effectively uh, there were, you know, there, there are two sides to the whole kind of conspiracy on her life. There's the, the MI6 or British establishment side to things, which were to do much to do, much more to do with her, the way we her behaviour within the royal family, her, her book, her Andrew Morton book, the way that she, you know, she became... A television interview. Yeah, the panorama interview. Yeah. Well, she became aware, I'm absolutely convinced of that as well, of, her, of the plot on her life. Well, she did she, say, didn't she, in, the, in this note that she handed to Paul Burrell, I'm going to read it out, actually, she said, um, in, she, she wrote this in October 1996, she said, this particular phase of my life, in my life, is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for him to marry. Yeah, yeah, and we found we found another. There's another note, same sentiment effectively, that was lodged with her lawyer, Lord Mishcon, uh, in November '95, around about the time of the Panorama interview, saying exactly the same. Effectively, wasn't there a video it's, of her as well? I mean, yeah, the text here says there wasn't there a video of her saying there was going to be an attempt on her life that's disappeared. Is that? Well, there's lots of things that disappeared. Uh, there were the letters as well that disappeared that were supposed to be put before the inquest that, that disappeared. They just disappeared. Uh, and they were, they were communications and correspondences between Prince Philip and, and Princess Diana and other, yeah, and other videotapes. There was a box, a, a specific chest that contained all this uh, stuff that mm. uh, went missing, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, the... So around that time, there was definitely, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, I mean, we, we, you can't prove these things, but we were certainly told that around 95... I've got to just say, yeah. that if you can hear anything, there is actually a rather large helicopter right over the studio right now making a lot of noise. Pure coincidence, I'm sure. <laughs> OK, carry on, John. She did say she, she might die in a helicopter accident as well. Um, yeah, so... So around this time, as we were told, there was a, 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 because of Prince Charles' desire to marry Camilla Parker Bowles, mm -hmm. and his ambition to do that, even though Diana was still alive, and that's the crucial point, that in itself caused a massive crisis constitutionally. So much so that um, I think in about 95, Tony Wright, who was the parliamentary aide to Lord Irvine, who was then Lord Chancellor, publicly stated that Prince Charles' marital ambitions uh, would end up in uh, the church being disestablished. It was such a massive constitutional problem. So the monarch would no longer be head of the church exactly, of England. Exactly. Yeah, and the church of England would no longer be in Parliament, for instance. Exactly. And, we would become House a Lords. secular state for the first time in, in British history. Mm. It was that massive at the time. Um, and, uh, and so there, there was some debate. There was some debate going on uh, as to how to deal with this. Yeah, and, and um, with... Uh, MI5, it, it's not quite as black and white as it, but it's the easiest way to explain it. With MI5 thinking that um, Camilla Parker Bowles was really the problem here. You know, to, any thought of getting rid of Diana was too stupid. It was too big. The backlash would be too much. If, on the other hand, in order to solve this constitutional problem, Camilla Parker Bowles uh, disappeared, then 
given public opinion uh, with regard to Camilla, especially at that time, uh, it would be easier to achieve. MI6, on the other hand, who are much more the British establishment, wanted to get rid of Diana. They'd been, that had been on the table for some time. Up at this, we're talking November 95. But MI5 wanted to get rid of Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla Parker Bowles, yeah. And she was involved, wasn't she, in a about mysterious six, road accident? Yeah, this is all forgotten, you see. About six weeks prior to Diana's death. And this is another point we must talk about as it well. It is in the book. Not, the whole, I don't know this myself. It is no, actually no, in the book. But the whole road traffic accident scenario is a known uh, assassination technique. The Boston Brakes. The Boston Brakes. Well, let's yeah. talk about that quickly, shall we? Okay. And then we'll go back to Camilla and okay. Boston yeah. Brakes. Yeah, the Boston Brakes. I mean, Diana always said herself she believed that um, her bodyguard and former lover, Sergeant Barry Manneke, who died in a road traffic accident in 1987, was killed by MI5. She stated that publicly, she stated that on video. And it went out on the ABC. Uh, ABC news network in, uh, in America. In America. Uh, and there are several other uh, instances of, of, of assassination by road traffic accident. The most famous, I suppose, apart from Diana, uh, must be uh, Sir Ranulph Fiennes. Now, Sir Ranulph Fiennes, everybody knows, is the world famous explorer. Yes. He's a former SAS officer. He's actually a personal friend of Prince Charles. He's a, he's a cousin to the royal family. You don't get sources much more eminent and, and credible, if you like, than that. Sir Ranulph Fiennes described in detail what the Boston Brakes uh, assassination technique is, how it works, and effectively it's... And, and he uh, uh, recounted one episode when uh, someone was assassinated in such a manner in England in 1986, a year before Barry Manneke died mm -hmm. in his road traffic accident. And effectively... It's uh, a small microchip that is planted on the car that takes over the car's steering and brakes and uh, the car is then taken over by remote control. But there must be some mechanical vehicle. thing. You can't, because cars aren't steered electronically, are they? Then? By an onboard computer, yeah. Um, John, we're going to have to go yeah, for a sure. break now. Uh, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments for John King, why not do so now to 8778 with the word edge and then your text. See you very soon. Welcome back to On The Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, John King. I apologise for having a few problems with our graphics tonight, but hey, we are live, so that's just how it is. John, just before the break, we were talking about uh, the Boston Breaks, and I was saying to you that um, I don't understand how you could take over the steering of a car with the use of some electronic device, because there's mechanical connection between the steering wheel and the wheels in most cars. Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert either on exactly how that works in terms of the actual mechanics of it, but I can only repeat what uh, Sir Ranulph Fiennes uh, describes in his book, and that is that uh, the, the, the microchip transceiver takes over the EMS, the electronic management system of the car, and uh, it uh, <coughs> is then taken over by remote control, and the car can be steered by remote control. I know it all sounds a bit James Bond, Theo, but you know th we can send rockets to the moon and Mars and wherever else by remote control. We can fly spy drones by remote control. You know we can drive cars by remote control, and cars can be taken over, according to Sir Arnold Fiennes, former SAS officer himself, and he 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 cites an example of the Boston Brakes in action where. Uh, a, a Major Michael Marmon, a f uh, an SAS officer at the time, was assassinated by the Boston Brakes method in a, in, a, in a car crash. The reason I was told in, in, in following up investigations and asking questions about the Boston Brakes amongst some of the SAS and, and guys that I, was, I was talking about earlier um, is, uh, is m it's used because it's deniable, simply because it's deniable. If you shoot someone, they've been assassinated. There's a there's, hole in them and it, exactly, it has to be explained, you know, yeah. Yeah, pretty well anyway. But, uh, you know, if someone dies in a car crash, people say, well, you know, it was a car crash. People have accidents. And, and so it, it's, it's very deniable. And it's, it's proved, uh, uh, allegedly anyway, it's, it's proved very successful for that reason. 
I've got Gerard in London is saying a drunk chauffeur in a powerful car seems more likely. Well, that's what you're supposed to think, isn't it? That's exactly what you're supposed to think. Is it impossible? It's not impossible, no. It's not impossible. But Henri Paul, all the evidence, when you look at the proper evidence, suggests that Henri Paul was not drunk. The, 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 very, the blood sample on which that verdict was based was never DNA tested or identified. And it also had a ridiculously high level of carbon monoxide. Yeah, the file from which it was taken was labelled unknown male. It wasn't Henri Paul's file. And it, yes, it contained 20.7% carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, if you or I had 20% carbon monoxide running around our blood right now... We'd be unconscious. We, we, we could certainly be unconscious, yeah. We, we'd certainly be extremely uncomfortable, especially if we had about one and a half or two bottles of wine inside us as well and prescription drugs. All of these... Uh, so it seems like it might have been the blood of somebody who'd committed suicide but hosed well, through the window of their sense, car. that makes sense, doesn't it? it yeah, does that makes absolute sense. Yeah. I know also there's a film of Henri Paul on the night in the Ritz Hotel right. doing his shoelace up, and he's doing his shoelace up standing up. He doesn't yeah. sit down. No, and he's talking to guests. Now, if you've had a drink, guests. I imagine it's actually quite hard to tie your shoelace up standing up, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, he's acting perfectly normally, talking to guests quite comfortably, being congenial, walking around like a very sober person. He may have had a couple of drinks. The, the evidence seems to suggest he did have a couple of Ricards at, at the uh, Ritz. Maybe he did. Even if he was blind drunk, it still doesn't prove it was a drink, a drink drive accident that killed Diana. No. But he wasn't blind drunk because there were two professionally trained VIP bodyguards with him. Both, you know, former, uh, well, Rhys Jones particularly, a former crack elite forces guy. And, and both of them testified that they were with him for two hours leading up to the drive from the Ritz to the Elmar Tunnel. And they have stated categorically that he was not drunk and they would not have let him drive the car had he been drunk. Um, no. And they're all, all the, site, the forensic evidence as well supports that claim. All right, let's, let's, look at, uh, let's go back to Camilla Parker Wells for a moment. Uh -huh. Assuming that MI5 wanted to kill her, yeah. would Charles have been involved in this, Prince Charles? Well, I don't, I, that, that is speculation that I, I, I really can't answer that. I mean, we all have our opinions, but I don't know. But what I do know is that... Camilla Parker Bowles was involved in a near fatal accident about six or eight weeks prior to Diana's accident and it was a very similar scenario. She was driving alone <coughs> in her car and she suddenly mysteriously lost control. This is exactly what happened to Omri Paul. This is exactly what Sir Ranulph Fine says happened in the scenario he uh, recounts. That also involved uh, a character named Sir Peter Horsley who was a former equerry to the Queen, an air, an air marshal, very high-ranking officer. Uh, he says as well that he was driving his car and at the moment the, uh, uh, another car overtook him and uh, uh, allegedly uh, took over the steering of his car, he'd completely lost control of his car. Now these are statements coming from, from the drivers of two uh, people who have been involved in these... Uh, scenarios and survived but of course Henri Paul didn't survive to tell us a tale but we do know he lost control and the, and the manner in which the car acted is precisely how the, 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 the cars acted in the other scenarios as well. It didn't just crash into a pillar. It, it, once he lost control of his car his brakes failed. He couldn't use his brakes. There were no skid marks or anything? There were no skid marks. There would have been obviously if he'd have, if he'd have had brakes. His brakes failed and he swerved one way, then the other way, and then back again into the concrete pillar. And that is very specific. There's a very, very specific manoeuvre because that's exactly what happened to Sir Peter Horsley as well. And, uh, uh, and in the case of Camilla Parker Bowles. So whatever we might think about the Camilla Parker Bowles scenario, MI5 being involved, I was told clearly and categorically that MI5 chose Camilla Parker Bowles as the one to get rid of and that would solve the constitutional crisis. It would also frighten Diana to death and bring her back into line because in their opinion she was out of line. It would you know, kind of create a scenario where she would be then forced to toe the line through her own sort of 
didn't, didn't uh, fear Char for her own life. Didn't Charles have another standby um, female? Well, several probably, but uh, certainly, yes, certainly. We know about Tiggy Leg Bork, don't we? The, yes. uh, the royal nanny, yeah. Yeah. Whom Diana thought he wanted to, to marry at one point, yeah. Okay. And so, if that was the case, then who knows what was going on. So, all right, well, uh, let us assume for a moment, th for the sake of this programme, that MI5 originally wanted to kill Camilla Parker Bowles. They made an attempt on her life, and that failed. Mm. Um, but you're saying that other dark forces, MI6, CIA, wanted to get rid of Diana at any cost. W you know, what was the motive? Because uh, did they care about the royal family's predicament? MI6 or was there more? Or yes, or was MI6, there... of course. MI6 is, is the royal intelligence agency, if you like. Yeah, they are, they, yes, very much so. I mean, MI6, Prince Philip is very closely involved with MI6. Not in operations uh, necessarily, but he's very uh, involved. He's his personal friend for years and years. The Bilderberg founder, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, is a known MI6 agent. There's very much in, involved. Whereas MI5 is more, you know, it is a more legitimate secret police agency, if you like. MI6 is. Well, it kills people much more nicely and politely. Yes, that's right. It? They're much more polite about it. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, well, they usually fail, don't they? So. <laughs> I, I don't six, know. <laughs> MI6 probably don't. Anyway, being more you know, serious about it, this, what brought the, the CIA into the equation, as far as uh, we've been able to discover, was unquestionably the landmine scenario. OK, let's talk about that then. Well, landmines, people's reaction when you say that, quite often is, you know, a few landmines, so you've got Stealth bombers costing God knows how much. A couple of billion dollars. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. A few landmines. Well, let me just put people right on that first of all. You know, there are 200 million landmines <coughs> deployed around the world as we speak. There are 200 million more stockpiled and ready to be used. There are over a billion small munitions that are inserted into these insidious, cowardly weapons that explode and, and fly off all over the place which also brings into the equation airborne mines. Uh, it wasn't just landmines Diana was campaigning for. It was specifically at the time, but the treaty that she persuaded President Clinton to look at and back and support uh, involved also... Anti-personnel. Anti-personnel landmines and airborne mines, which people... Those again, are the fragmentary bombs that break up into lots of different pieces, yeah, and just bombs, as was yeah. used in Gaza recently. Exactly, like the phosphorus bombs and like the depleted uranium cluster bombs used in Iraq and probably Afghanistan as well. Uh, we're talking a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. It's not just a few landmines. And she did get Clinton to agree to ban them. And then I'm, re I'm remembering yeah. this from your book, That's but right. he then, as soon as she had died, went back on his word. That's right, yeah. She single-handedly persuaded President Clinton to effectively U-turn on, on US defense policy, and he upset an awful lot of people, you know, in the military industrial complex in, in, in America and in the CIA, by taking a stand and agreeing to support publicly and, and officially uh, sign the treaty, which was then going to be the Oslo Treaty, which would have banned the manufacture, sale, and deployment of all mines worldwide. Yeah, three weeks after Diana died. Clinton gave a speech from the Oval Office saying he changed his mind. Uh, but what led to that, we were told, was that with Diana out of the way, he, he, he was able to do that. But stepping back a little bit prior to that, Di yes, Diana persuaded him to <coughs> support this, uh, the whole landmine scene. But it's also what, um, you know, what, what she was kind of highlighting in Angola. Angola, I know she went to Bosnia as well, but Angola was really the centre of her landmines campaign. And when Diana went to Angola, the world's media followed her. Those famous you images know. of her standing there with yeah. the plastic mask that's and the right. body armour and yeah, she going through the... into a minefield, yeah. Well, that's pretty... Yeah. It is very brave of her, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And just down there behind, behind that line of trees there was the Bush-Cheney oil syndicate and the CIA and MI6 mercenaries all sorting out who's, gonna, who's going to... To, to win the spoils and, and, and divide up 
Angola's massive oil supply. Because Angola is actually incredibly rich in minerals absolutely. and oil, and They're yet the people much, yeah. who live there live on less than a dollar a day. That's right. Still. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. There was an awful lot going on in Angola. As I say, when I, uh, that was the point of me kind of explaining a little bit at the beginning of the show about knowing the guys who was working out there as mercenaries, uh, fighting on one side while the British government was supporting the other side. America with Bush and Ch Dick Cheney's company, particularly Halliburton, Halliburton and yeah. Brown and Root, sorting out dodgy deals for the, for the MPLA rebels out there on the promise of future oil on the cheap. Uh, you know, all this came out after Diana's death, but it's official. It's officially there now. It, it, you know, these, I'm not just this is shooting not conspiracy from the hip theory. No, this, is this is fact. Established human, human rights history. watch the NGO uh, okay. published all these. All facts. right. So let, let's say then that you've gone some way towards establishing a motive for the well, several motives yeah. for the assassination of Princess Diana. Let's look at what happened on the scene. I've got a text here from. Um, Simon in Devon, and he says, is it true that the security cameras uh, just so happened to be turned off that day at the scene of the accident? Is that true? Well, what we've found out now, I mean, there was a lot of talk and a lot of questions, and uh, so in the initial couple of years after Diana's accident, the French inquiry, which culminated, I think, in 99, so that was a very immediate inquiry uh, afterwards. But then, of course, we had Lord Stevens' investigation and for three years, from 2004 to 2007, then the inquest. So a lot of information has been clarified over, over the years. So now we know for certain that there were at least 10 CCTV cameras on the route, uh, plus one other on the fly past, the, 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 the bridge, the bridge looking back down onto the road going under the tunnel. Yeah. Okay. The 10 cameras lining the route, and this is official, this is actually in the inquest's report now, okay. were turned inwards, filming the brickwork on which they were mounted. Every single one of them? Every one of them, all well, 10 of them. And the one just on the fly pass wasn't working. Surely. <laughs> so, therefore, allegedly, we have no uh, video images of the journey or the crash. That's, that's the official line. So. Uh, Although it could be that they were filming, and it's just that they don't want anyone to see the film, possibly. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, that's, that's, uh, with the CCTV cameras, that, that's... Exactly. I mean, we know uh, about 15 or 20 minutes before the crash, a woman was caught speeding going through the Almar Tunnel. And, but they don't have, uh, certainly didn't have then, uh, they may still not have, but in Paris in 97, there were no fixed speed cameras. It was all the mobile uh, yeah. cameras. And one of the paparazzi um, who was interviewed by the French inquiry, who refused to be interviewed by the British inquiry, of course you can do that. You know, that's another advantage of assassinating someone on foreign soil, because when it comes to the investigation, any of, any, any of the, the culprits or su suspects can just say, well, I'm sorry, I don't really feel like being interviewed today. And they don't have to be. And so, uh, you know, we'll talk about that a bit later, if you like, how the, the inquest was just a complete whitewash. But one paparazzo, anyway, did come forward and say that he saw a police camera in the tunnel, or just at the entrance to the tunnel, uh, just prior to uh, the accident, and that that must have been the one that filmed this woman who was speeding. And she was convicted of speeding? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so... Let's talk about some of the things that happened then. There was a white Fiat Uno, wasn't there? There was. That was identified as having been in contact with the Mercedes that Diana yeah. was in. Yeah, that's definite, yeah. Um, but the white Fiat Uno has never been found. No. Uh, and the, the reason that it was identified was because the paint was on the Mercedes. Yeah, it's absolutely. And it was yeah. identified chemically as, yeah. the, as a white Fiat Uno paint. That's right. And people had seen it as well. There were witnesses yeah. who saw it. So yeah. um, there's a bit of weird stuff about the Uno, isn't there? Let's talk about Anderson, shall we? James Anderson, yeah. James Anderson for a long time. Um, it, well, first of all, let's just, yeah, the, the Uno was definitely involved in the crash. We know that. That's, they've admitted that. Even, even the, you know, the French have now admitted that it was definitely involved. So was a high-powered motorbike and so was a second Mercedes. There were f at least four vehicles, including Diana's, involved in a fatal crash in the middle of Paris, which involved the death of a British royal 
and all, well, apart from Diana's Mercedes, the other three vehicles, all of them and their owners or drivers, disappeared without trace. Now, you know, if that's not suspicious, then I don't know what is. And wasn't there a motorbike blocking off one of the other routes that was originally intended to be that's taken? That's another vehicle. I knew there was another one, yeah. <laughs> that's right. So because Henri Paul had taken this other route, it's not such a strange route, actually. It was a route taken by a lot of the limousine drivers in Paris to avoid the uh, traffic jam on the Champs-Élysées. So they did take this route sometimes. So Anything uh, rather than going around the Arc de Triomphe. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a nightmare, isn't, isn't it? it? So, um, but he had to, then to get back to Dodi's department, just before the Almar Tunnel, he had to take the slip road off, but he couldn't, because there was a motorbike park broadside across that exit way. So he was forced to carry on. Then we know the white Fiat Uno dipped out in front of him, clipped the Uno, and then the rest is history, as, as they say. And the Uno driver, there were no tyre marks, remember, no skid marks, rather, not from the, from the Uno or Diana's Mercedes. So that Uno driver had the presence of mind, having been hit, even if it was just glance, but he was hit by four tonnes of speeding metal that smashed into a concrete pillar and spun round in front of him, two seconds in front of him. Yeah. He had the presence of mind just to slow down gradually and drive, drive on, but didn't break. There were no, there were no brake marks. Well, he didn't break hard. He didn't break at all. But he didn't, he didn't skid. According to, he didn't break. Really? Uh, we, we interviewed uh, Professor Murray Mackay at Birmingham University, who is Britain's foremost crash expert. Okay. World renowned. The Uno didn't break, even. There was no evidence to show that it even broke. It just it braked. It just uh, carried on. So it was driven past. by somebody who was extremely without capable question, of. Yeah, without question, yeah, in my opinion. All right. So, yes, and, but which I wanted to just say that because there was a lot of speculation that James Anderson, who did own a Fiat Uno, a white Fiat Uno, that fitted that description. And he was a paparazzi, paparazzo. He was, he was indeed, yeah. Yeah. And an MI6 agent uh, was driving that Fiat Uno and that it was his. That never really sat that comfortably, comfortably with me. I mean, if he was involved in such a high-profile uh, assassination operation, I just couldn't see the sense that he would be driving his own car. You know, it, would, it, would, it just didn't seem to fit. In any case, the evidence seemed to suggest that Anderson was very definitely a paid informant. But whether he was a hired assassin, that's a different thing altogether. And so uh, we don't think now that James Anderson was driving that Fiat Uno. But the point is, that's, this is you know, the inquest has taken two or three almost red herrings really, they've hung the whole story on these three points, you know. Was James Anderson driving that Fiat Uno? No? Well, MI6 weren't involved then, were they? You know. Was Diana pregnant? No? Well then there's no motive for her death, is there? You know, they, they picked, they plucked these, these, these points out and blew them up out of proportion. The whole inquest was, was based in the end. Well. On, on Mohammed Al Fayed's allegation that she was pregnant with Dodi's child, therefore, and she that was they married. were engaged. Yeah, yeah. But the inquest started with a remit that big. Uh, 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 Lord Stevens' remit in the first instance was to investigate. I can't quote it exactly, so I'll paraphrase, but I'm pretty close. Investigate whether or not. Diana and Dodi died by any other means than a simple road traffic accident. In other words, was foul play involved? It was a, a, an open-ended remit, and that was how it was worded. When we received the, um, when the uh, report was published three years later and four million pounds worth of tax, British taxpayers' money later, suddenly the remit was that. The it was an investigation into Mohammed Al Fayed's claim. Allegation, I'm sorry, was the word. Uh, an allegation made by Mohammed Al Fayed of conspiracy to murder. That was it. That was the sole. That that was what had happened. So anything outside of that, anything to do with landmines, for example, or anything that would have given the, them power to to subpoena the uh, the paparazzi or whoever they wanted and really question people and find things out, was taken away completely. And now all the inquest had to do was prove that. Uh, Diana, uh, Mohammed Al Fayed's allegation yeah. held no, no substance, and so 
I mean, it, that was what it was all hung on. I think it's worth making the point that Mohammed Al Fayed was clearly hugely distressed by the death of his son. Of course, and, of course. And you know, our sympathy obviously goes out to him. But it's also possible to say that he might not have been the best person to try and stir the waters to get a decision because of some of the things he himself said, which kind of muddied the waters a bit, don't you think? Yeah, quite possibly, yeah. It was a very difficult scenario for him. I, I, I agree. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a son in, in, those, well, in any circumstances. No. Uh, and Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't really want to <clears throat> talk about Mohammed. I mean, we, we, we met, John and I met him a couple of times and we didn't have anything to do with him in terms of his investigation was his and ours was ours. He did, uh, we did uh, um, a book signing at Harrods when the first hardback edition came out. Um, well, he, he was there for your book signing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, when it first came out. Um, but that was the extent of it. I mean, I, I don't really want to talk too much about Mohammed Al Fayed. Like okay. you say, I, 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 I'm, I'm total sympathy for yes. him. But <clears throat> in a way, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame that he was up front saying some of the things he was saying and acting in the way he was acting, especially at the inquest. Yes. In my opinion. So, in, in a sense, well, OK, perhaps we shouldn't talk about him, so yeah. we won't. But um, let's, let's go back to the Alma Tunnel. So we've got 10 or 11 cameras that weren't working. We've got a police speed trap camera that apparently was and wasn't there. We've got three other vehicles in the tunnel, plus another one blocking an exit ramp, yeah. that have all disappeared and never been found. Uh, let's look at the accident. Let's look at just after the accident. You know, we've, we've got another about just a minute to the break, so quickly, let's look at what, what was the scene when the accident had occurred. Well, what we do know is before the ambulances arrived, um, James Anderson was almost certainly in the tunnel because he boasted to friends afterwards that he was in the tunnel and he took compromising photographs and he was about to publish them in a book. And his, his place <coughs> was broken into where the photographs were stored. That's right, just after he was, he was murdered. Well, he was found in a burnt out car 400 miles from where he was supposed to be with a hole in his temple, a bullet hole in his temple. Uh, but of course he committed suicide. <laughs> yes. I'd... I that's that's the official that story. Well, yes. So, yeah, whatever went on in the tunnel there and then, James Anderson certainly knew because he, he photographed it. John, we're going to go for another break now. Once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments, why not do so now? See you very soon. Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, John King. Uh, John, uh, just before the break there, we were talking about the scene in the Alma Tunnel uh, after the crash. Um, do you want to carry on at that point? Well, yeah, we were talking about, uh, and James Anderson, uh, we now know, <coughs> certainly, um, so, uh, that he was uh, in the tunnel at that time, immediately after the crash, that he said that he witnessed the crash. He took photographs in the tunnel. Uh, as we were saying just before the break, uh, we now know that those photographs were, were stored at the SEPA uh, press agency, where, of whom he was working at the time in Paris. But that agency was broken into. His entire photographic archive was stolen, never to be seen again. And no one else's was, was it? Just his? Just his was targeted. And, uh, and yes, James Anderson himself was a very interesting character, actually if we had more time to talk about him, but certainly uh, he was found dead in his burnt out car. He'd set himself alight, allegedly, uh, when he'd set out to Paris, uh, towards Paris for a meeting. With, with his publisher? Yeah, that's yeah. right, indeed. Because he was planning to publish a book. We now know that, uh, the, the, the photographs he'd taken. He, was fa he uh, ended up 400 miles the other way in the south of France. Uh, with a with a bullet hole in his head, but of course the uh, and the, it locked inside his own car. And no, the keys weren't in there. Keys weren't there. No, that's quite a trick, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, very suspicious circumstances surrounding James Anderson's death. And, I mean, it, you know, it, we checked actually, interestingly, of uh, the percentage of people who commit suicide 
that set themselves alight. And it's something less than 0 0.1 or something. I think anyone I'm ever familiar with is that Buddhist monk. Exactly. The famous... only other ones we could find were, were, were religious or, or, or just, just caused type deaths, you know, like, like the monk you just mentioned. It's a famous image, isn't and it? And the only other one we found was a French judge called Judge Borrell, who was working in, in a former, uh, former French colony in, in Central Africa, prosecuting a president there who was uh, um, suspected of, of various, uh, uh, I think it was, um, um, I can't remember exactly what it was anyway, something uh, involved like murder and, and conspiracies and things. But this judge, anyway, was also found dead in his own burnt out car. And the, the connection there is that the same pathologist who uh, pronounced that he had committed suicide was the same pathologist who uh, autopsied Henri Paul, uh, Professor Lecomte. Uh, that's just an interesting correlation there, really, because uh, if Professor Lecomte's record is anything to go by in, in Henri Paul's. Uh, autopsy where she was completely incompetent she didn't even know how many or one minute she took five five files of blood then it was uh, then it was three these 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 are recorded details and this is this is someone who's just kind of carrying out a very high profile autopsy here uh, Omri Paul's measurements were all wrong his number was switched with Dodi Fayed they didn't know who was who you know the story I mean yes. then all this carbon monoxide was found in his blood this is the same the same uh, and anyway at the end of the day um, Omri Paul was, uh, was found to be drunk, according to the same pathologist who said that Judge Borrell committed suicide in the same manner as, as James Anderson was supposed to have committed suicide, which uh, you can make your own mind up about that, I reckon. I think I probably already <coughs> have. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have witnesses as well. There are various witnesses in the tunnel, aren't there? People who've seen certain things, like the white car speeding away, the Mercedes yeah. and the motorbike, high-powered motorbike and so on. That's right, yeah. Well, Gary, Gary Hunter in particular was a, quite a high-profile high witness at the time. He was a, a London lawyer who was um, staying in Paris with his wife at the time in the hotel. Didn't overlook the Almar Tunnel, it was the Almar Hotel. But it, 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 it overlooked the road that was leading away from the Almar Tunnel. And yes, he, he, he was awoken by a, a loud bang of, that he assumed was a car crash. Uh, two bangs, actually, two explosions, as he described them, in the tunnel. And by the time he got to the window to try and crane his neck around to see what, what it might have been, he saw what... Uh, he described as a small Fiat Uno type car speeding away with another Mercedes car, bumper to bumper. He described them bumper to bumper. He, said, he actually said it was as if the Mercedes was shielding the, 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 the smaller car. Mm. Uh, so that was a, an interesting. Win. But yeah, there were, quite, there, were, there were seven eyewitnesses in the tunnel who, who described the Fiat Uno. And the, and the high-powered motorbike also involved in the crash. Okay, well, interesting. And of course, Diana was alive after the crash, wasn't she? Because she spoke to various people. She did, yeah. And Rhys Jones, of course, was alive and still is. Yeah. Dodi Fayed was dead, dead. On, dead at the scene, and Henri Paul was dead at the scene. Instantly. Now, we're going to get to this subject. I've got texts about it. I've had loads of texts about it, so I'm going to read this one out. <coughs> this is AJ in Cambridgeshire. What about the delays in getting Diana to hospital? Uh, Comma, making sure she died at the scene. Well, I understand she didn't die at the scene, did she? So. Well, again, there were a lot of questions to begin with, and uh, we asked them all in our first book uh, to do with the emergency operation. So many questions that, that, that remain unanswered. How, how, let's discuss, how long did it take to get her to, what is it, Le Petit Salt Petrier yes, Hospital? Salt Petrier. Uh, around two hours. I, say, I haven't got the figures in front of me at the moment, but about two hours, just over two, about two hours, six minutes. This is like. ludicrous, isn't it's it? It's 3.25 miles away. 3.25. So over two hours to get a yeah. uh, princess yeah. uh, to a hospital, and it wasn't even the nearest hospital. They no. actually drove past another hospital with an accident room, they with an A&E They did, department. yeah. They did, indeed. So, so okay, the, yeah, yeah, the why did it take so long? What were they doing? <laughs> Well, the, the official story now is that Diana, uh, they, they, the point, we, we interviewed, an interesting point, we, in, we interviewed a senior paramedic uh, in this country. 
we do have to take into. I, I, I must be careful because I, I do want to just say before I say anything else that the guys on the ground out there who came to the scene, they were in three ambulances. They were they were paramedics, and I have every respect for paramedics. It's, it's a, an awesome job they do, uh -huh. and they weren't secret agents dressed up as paramedics. They were paramedics. You know, the, the whole of Paris was there. The, the, who was in the tunnel? the initial couple of minutes after the accident, that's another question. Well, but once I, the ambulances got there, they were paramedics and doctors on the scene. Let, so, let me read this text yeah. out, because this might be informative. Uh, this is from Marie in Blackburn. She says, am I mistaken? I'm sure in the first reports of the accident, Diana walked into the ambulance, so I thought it wasn't too serious. Well, this is what I'm saying, that, you know, when... Did she walk into the ambulance? Uh, well, after the f initial... Uh, you know, all, in the melee that followed Diana's death, there were all kinds of reports, and, and, and uh, some of it was true and some of it wasn't. And, and it seems now that no, she didn't walk into the ambulance. It okay. seems that she had a heart attack through low blood pressure while she was still in the car, while they were trying to extricate her, which then um, caused the doctor to think, well, we better get her into the ambulance and do whatever you do heart to massage someone. Heart or something? Yeah, whatever. But all of this then, it took about 45, 46 minutes to get her from the car into the ambulance before the ambulance even moved. Now, when I interviewed uh, the, the paramedic officer who's quoted in the book, you know, he, he, he has total respect. Again, France does have a different system. They have these SAMU ambulances, which are effectively operating theatres on wheels compared to ours. They don't necessarily rush their patients off the hospital. Um, but, except in a high, a high impact uh, collision, you have to assume that the victim might be bleeding internally. That is the golden rule. You have to well, assume... Well, even in France, it's the golden rule. Yes, you have to assume... So does that mean that the golden rule is also that you rush that person to hospital? If you think that they could be, ble yes, bleeding internally, So yeah. why did it take them two hours <coughs> to drive well, three and exactly. a half miles? Exactly, you tell me. They could, it took 46 minutes to get them into the ambulance, and then we now know that the doctor in charge instructed the, the ambulance driver, quote, drive slowly. And we know that the, the, the ambulance drove at about eight miles an hour from the tunnel to the hospital. Now, he says well, it's I'm because... I'm sorry, even at eight miles an hour, it's not going to take two hours, is it? No, it didn't, because there was, uh, it took them 15 minutes to get there, then it took another X amount of time to get her out of the car, further time to... The actual journey from the tunnel to the hospital was something like 25, 26 minutes or something But like didn't that. it stop en route for 15 yes, minutes? Yes, once it got there, it stopped practically outside the, the uh, hospital doors uh, for another 10 minutes. And the doctor says that he thought that, that Diana may have been cardiac uh, arresting again, so, but she wasn't, but he thought she may have been, so it took 10 minutes to... This is the official report. Again, you can, you know... It, we can only make assumptions, really, can't we? I, I'm not going to sit here and say the paramedics murdered Diana, because I don't think they did. I think the damage was done before the paramedics got there. Who may have been working in cahoots with who, that's, those, those are questions that still need to be answered. OK, well, I, you know, I know there are people who think <coughs> that she was killed in the ambulance. Um, do we know that the people who manned that ambulance that she was in on that night were regular ambulance crew, first of all. Do we know who they are? I mean, do you know their names? And yeah. have they been interviewed by yeah. people other than the police? Yes, they have, and we have to say that now. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like before we knew, before Lord Stephen's investigation, we didn't know. They were just anonymous faces that were allegedly paramedics and doctors. But now, yes, they, they've all been identified and named, and they are regular paramedics. The point is, if this was... Uh, from my point of view now, and from what I was told and what John and I discovered in our investigation, I am absolutely as convinced as I'll ever be that this was a Boston Brakes assassination. And you don't need paramedics to do anything. I think she was, she was on her way. She, if she wasn't dead, she wasn't dead when they got there, but she was past uh, saving. But and, and the doctors have said that anyway. The doctor at the, the, the hospital said, if, if you'd have picked Diana up and put her in a uh, a fighter jet and flew her there in three seconds, we still couldn't have saved her. She, she, uh, her aorta was ripped 
she was she was on her way out. There is something else, isn't there, that she wasn't wearing a seatbelt. That's that's right. Yeah. And there's a good reason for that, isn't there? There is indeed. Yeah. Do because, you want to tell us? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was jammed. It was jammed. Uh, quote jammed in the retracted position, unquote. That is now official in the inquest report. Um, and all the other seatbelts were working perfectly well, but Diana's seatbelt, the rear right seatbelt, she was sitting in the rear right seat. Is that the place she would have automatically been? I think so, yeah, presumably. I mean, I, I, that, that's that a good question. Because that would put her behind yeah. the driver. That's right. No, uh, uh, no, 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 would put her behind the <coughs> bodyguard. Behind the bodyguard, yeah, yeah. So uh, only her seatbelt wasn't working, yeah. Did he have, did the bodyguard, Rhys Jones, did he have his seatbelt on? Conflicting reports, conflicting reports. The French inquiry concludes that he did. The British inquiry concludes that he didn't. So... And, and does he remember? You know, no. No, he doesn't how, remember how, anything. He did say, he... actually, he remembered being followed into the tunnel by a high-powered motorbike that was chasing them. But then after that, his memory's gone, he says. So... Okay. That's what he said. And was Dodi Fayed wearing a seatbelt? No, none of them were. None Henri of them Paul? were. No. 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 But the point with Diana is, uh, after the crash, all of her friends and, 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 and family, everybody who knew her closely, was publicly stunned that she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, simply because of her own, her fears for her own life. And she it always had, wore a seatbelt, apparently, Yeah, it had become she? like a almost a religious observance of hers, you know, she become so paranoid or, or frightened that she... It just, well, given, just, given that she thought she was going to die in well, a car exactly. accident... Yeah, so yeah. she always wore a seatbelt. She always wore a seatbelt. So belt. it would take very special circumstances for her to not wear a seatbelt. Yeah, like it not working properly. I, I, I mean, she was, you know, they were travelling quite fast en route. But they, um, there, there were early reports in all the papers, including on the BBC, that said that the speedo of the car was stuck at something like 120 right. miles an hour, or was yeah. it kilometres an hour, but a very high speed <coughs> anyway. 120, that's right, yeah. Miles an hour. Yes. And but of course, it it's an electronic speedo anyway, and yeah. it goes to zero. It always reverts to zero, yeah. So, so it, was was just a, it was a lie. Sort of, it, was just Somebody... part of, it was all part of, yes, it was a blatant lie, yeah, like a lot of the stuff coming out of that time, with the pictures of Henri Paul standing there with a drink in his hand on the front page saying, drunk driver. There was no proof of that. There was no evidence of that. No. You know, that was two, three days after the after the after the incident. It was a nice, easy, you know, thing. The media wasn't it? had been primed. They had been primed with, with what to put out. I'm absolutely. Kidding. It was all part of the of the yes. cover up. I've I've got a text in here from Simon in Devon who says, "Do you think there was anything ritualistic about the car hitting the thirteenth pillar? As this number is said to be important to secret societies." Well, possibly. I, I, it's quite hard to organise which pillar you're going well, to Well, it, it, it is. It is. I mean, I personally, you know, I've heard that theory. I've heard people talk about that. I've seen articles written about it. But um, for me, the important thing is establishing whether or not she was assassinated. That's the point, really, for me, that of, 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 in, of writing the book, from the, what in, impelled me to write it. So... Um, I tend to try and not get too involved in that side of things, the, the, the more ritualistic side. And, I mean, the secret society side in terms of uh, you know, MI6 being involved in, in, in secret societies, of course they are. You know, there are secret society, Freemasonic lodges uh, all over Europe, etc., <clears throat> where they can mingle and talk and plan operations quietly. Um, that happens, you know. But in terms of the more esoteric side of things, then maybe, maybe not. What well, do you think, I mean, do you think yourself that there was a Masonic connection? Masonic in terms of what? In terms of the people who might have had a motive or an opportunity or who were involved in some way? Well, there are various levels of Mas you know, Masonic lodges and Masonic degrees, so certainly at the higher levels, possibly, yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I, there is a lot of very good evidence that high-ranking MI6 officers who are often stationed at, at consuls or embassies abroad also have their own stations and their own sort of substations within Masonic groups. Yeah, because they're very, they're, it, it's common sense when you think about it because the Masonic groups are, are sworn to secrecy, you know, so the conversations that take place, uh, uh, 
prohibited secret, which is what uh, MI6... Uh, they like that sort of thing. They don't, they? don't mind, yeah, keeping things uh, secret. Yeah, but no, seriously, I mean, yes, Masonic lodges are that without question used as uh, kind of, you know... But not, not in terms of... Um, it wasn't the Freemasons behind it per se. You know, I know a lot of people who are just local kind of Freemasons who probably wouldn't have anything to do with this. OK. So... <sighs> You're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that you, your belief is that it was a Boston Breaks deliberate assassination. Yeah. Uh, but that the ambulances and all that story about the delays and all that was just coincidental, if you like. Well, no, I'm not saying that either. What I am saying is that there are a lot of accusations flying around without any evidence, just, just, just suspicion and... and Anomalies and questions. Well, it does seem extraordinary, doesn't it, that the ambulance yes, it took does, yeah. two hours to I get agree. down I agree. to a hospital three and a half miles away. Yes, I and agree. And it wasn't even the nearest hospital with an A and E. I mean, why no, would they right. go to this Petit Salpetriere hospital instead of the one that was down the road? Well, it was it was about another three quarters of a mile past it. So, an ambulance travelling at a normal speed that wouldn't have made any difference. But of course, when you're travelling at eight miles an hour, it did make a difference. Mm. They say that the, the, that, uh, the, the hospital they went to was better equipped. Um, the surgeon was there. Well, the surgeon could have just driven down the road to the other hospital if, if, if necessary, of course. But um, yeah, I agree. I agree. There are still a lot of questions that remain unanswered yeah. and a lot of anomalies that remain unresolved. Well, 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 we, there are other but, things that happened to Diana, obviously, in the hospital, and we'll get to those in a minute. Yeah. But I just wanted to ask you one question here because I know you do know this. Uh, I don't know who sent this text. Do you know the Merc was stolen a month before the crash? That's right, yeah, which leads back to what Serrano Fines was saying about this little microchip transceiver because, yeah, the Merc was stolen, but the only thing that was stolen from the Mercedes while it was missing was this little EMS chip, the electronic management, management system chip, basically this, the onboard computer. Yeah, but I don't understand this because if I was going to do one of these assassinations using this chip, if I stole the Mercedes, I would put the chip in and they would never know that it had been changed. Why would they take the chip out and then give the car back, if you like, minus the chip, so then you have to go, oh, dear, well, what's... We don't know who, who, who repaired the car, either. The car was also <clears throat> left unattended for, for about three hours prior to it being driven round to the Ritz. It was the only available car on the night. But that was the car. There was no question about that was the car that was going to be used. When that was, was the one with the chip business, with the seatbelt that didn't... Seatbelt that didn't unroll. work. ...unroll. The, the replaced EMS chip, the unattended car parts in the Vendôme underground car park. Again, no, no, no security cameras watching it yeah. for three hours prior to um, it being used for that for that journey. So, yeah, the, the thing is, Theo, we can't. I can't sit here, and nobody can sit here and say this is what happened, and here's the smoking gun evidence. I know all the answers to all the questions no, because you... I don't. But at least you've cleared up some of the but, things. Uh, some things that I didn't know, and even things <coughs> perhaps that might not have been in the book. Let me just go to another quick question here. Uh, mm. from John on Anglesey. Um, another John, spelled the same way as you, J-O-N. Uh, John, he says, have you done research into the technology behind the so-called flash gun used? Yes, some, yeah. That's is, that, is that part of your thesis? That it it is, like, that Poss it... quite possibly, yeah. One guy we spoke, I spoke to... Uh, um, former SAS sergeant, Sergeant Dave Cornish, who explained in quite uh, detail about the, the strobe gun that, uh, that was probably used alongside the um, taking over, the, taking out the brakes. Yes. Uh, as he, 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 he thought that quite, in his experience, what would have happened would, as the, we know that a high-powered motorbike overtook the Mercedes uh -huh. just after the Fiat Uno had clipped it, so it was very precise manoeuvring, whatever was going yeah, on there. Yeah, quite, yes. And it sounds as... crowded tunnel. Yes, exactly. It's only a two-lane tunnel. Yeah. Um, two lanes either side, you mean, don't you? Going in, down into the... Yeah. Into the... Two yes. lanes either direction. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Two, like a dual, dual carriageway. Yeah. So, yeah, so he said that, yeah, the Fiat Uno would have been weighed down with concrete blocks or something of that nature to, to, to weigh it down and be custom, custom weighted is what he said. The person inside there would have had the remote control for, for steering the for the Mercedes, and the guy coming past on the on the um, motorbike 
would have had the flash scan, which would have blinded. I mean, these things can blind you for certainly for up to three minutes, literally blackout. You can't see anything. They're so powerful; they can give, they can cause like um, retinal retinal damage. Retinal. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> So if you were driving a car, and especially when you're in a tunnel, which is fairly dark, I mean, obviously, I know there were lights, but it's fairly dark, so your, your eyes would be receptive to light, yeah. you know, the pupils would be open. And so there were several, several witnesses who saw a flash. But wouldn't that same flash have affected the guy on the motorbike and the guy in the Fiat? No, because it's, no, because it, it's, it's a weapon. It's not just a, a, it's a, a, a tested weapon that, that uh, Richard Tomlinson, an MI6 officer, explained all about as well in his affidavit to the French inquiry. It's a, it's a, a, a directional weapon. Really? It's, he gave evidence to the French inquiry about this? But uh -huh. they dismissed it, presumably? They did, well, they, yes, they dismissed that evidence and, and they got to him be, before the inquest as well. Well, he didn't speak at the inquest. He did speak at the inquest, but everything he'd said up to that point, he completely U-turned. But just prior to him being interviewed, his house was broken into by French intelligence, his computers were stolen, his, his credit cards were stolen, his personal planner was stolen, his passports, he has two because he's uh, dual nationality, uh, British and New Zealand. Uh, and whatever else happened to him, I don't know, but after that, suddenly, his story changed, his massive story. I mean, this is the guy who's identified MI6 files to the French inquiry, identifying Henri Paul as an MI6 agent. Not have a look around and see what you can find. These files, these numbers I'm giving you, they will show you that Omri Paul, is a, who works at the uh, Ritz Hotel here, he's an MI6 asset. Go and go and check it and out. And he had a wad of cash on him, didn't he? His body. Omri Paul. Had a, yes, Omri Paul had a wad of yeah. cash on him and, uh, and he disappeared for a couple of hours before. He did indeed. He drove the car. Yeah, well, we now know. And this is official. Now, we've always said, I mean, the information that I received was without question. He was meeting up with his MI6 handler in that time. But we, we do know, official now, that he did meet with his French intelligence handler uh, during those two hours. That's, that's in the French report. He, he was found with his um, diary, had his, his contact number at French intelligence written in it. So he was definitely, definitely working for French intelligence. Our information is he's working for MI6 as well. Uh, Richard Tomlinson said exactly the same, and he identified MI6 files, which would have identified Henri Paul as an MI6 agent. Uh, and yes, he did have a wad of cash on him after... Was it about 2,000 ba pounds? About that, yeah. And um, he always had a lot of money in his bank account, which wasn't explained by his wages. No, he had about 170,000 pounds in, in 15 separate ca so accounts. So just briefly, was he a patsy? Yes, he was without a patsy. question, yes. Definitely a patsy. He didn't know he was driving to his death, I'm sure. No. OK, we're going to go for another break now. Once again, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments to John King, please do so now. Just text 8777 with the word EDGE and then your text. And we'll see you soon. Welcome back to On the Edge with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, John King, author of Princess Diana, The Evidence. And also, I'm going to tell you his website now before I forget, which is www.consciousape.com. Conscious Ape. Um, I'm going to read a few texts out quickly. Why blind the driver with a flash gun when there was a microchip, microchip driving the car? That's Greg in Bristol. Maybe they didn't. I'm just saying that, that, that those, that these are reports that are, that are certainly witness reports of a, a blinding flash. And it, the, the, it was Richard Tomlinson who brought that up. The, the strobe gun is a known uh, special forces weapon to, to blind someone in those kind of instances. So okay. maybe they did, maybe they didn't. OK. Do you think Henry Paul was subjected to mind control techniques so that he could be triggered into crashing the car? Simon in Devon, that's a good question. Who knows? Quite possibly, yeah, quite possibly. OK, this is a guy, Mad Max in Derby. Apparently one French witness saw the bike and flash and one guy got off the bike and made cutthroat gesture with his finger to show she was dead. Uh, is this, and then he's cut off, so I don't know. That's who. right, yeah, that was, uh, I think that was Francois Levistre who saw that. Uh, he, he saw the flash in his wing mirror, uh, in his rear view mirror, got out the car, looked back, and the guy on the motorbike who had driven past uh, and, and was probably responsible for the, for the flash, if there was one, yeah, did make a gesture, according to Francois Levistre. OK. Uh, if John's theory on the Boston Brakes is correct, was the chip ever found in the crashed car? That's John. Well, we don't know, because the crashed car was not uh, investigated by anyone. It should have been investigated by the, the, the experts who um, 
were appointed to look at the the, the, the wreckage were you know French secret police uh, secret agents and and whoever they're, they're working for you know specialised teams the, the Mercedes engineers weren't allowed to look at the car they weren't allowed to go anywhere near the car right okay this is a really good text here the strobe weapon is known as a sun blaster used against vehicles and aircraft as about the explosive half cap as about, I don't quite understand that also used to disable moving vehicles cheers ex special forces there we are there you are so a few people God, they're coming in thick and fast now um, Chrissy and Ashford I've always known she was disposed of because she was treading on the toes of the establishment thank you for your work yeah, that's obviously you. for you, uh, Chrissy, from Chrissy in Ashford. OK, um, a chap called Tino, it's scrolled off the screen now. Oh, no, do you believe Diana was pregnant? Thanks, Tino. We are <laughs> going to get to that question. So, was she pregnant? Well, we'll never know. But I just before we go into that, I just want to say, I, I, I was talking a bit earlier about these nuggets of things that they, that they hung the, the inquest on. Was she pregnant? The inquest effectively proved officially that she wasn't, therefore there was no motive for her death. But the point is, it doesn't matter whether she was pregnant. She was very definitely in what appeared to be a long, the beginning of a long-term relationship with Dodie Fayette. And it was, was very the near the start of the relationship, and she hadn't really got over that Hasnat Khan guy, had she? The, no, the but surgeon. even so, even so, Apparently. the fear wasn't, was she pregnant? It was my God, she could get pregnant at any moment. She could get pregnant at any time. If she was with Dodie Fayed for any period of time, she could have got pregnant at any time. So the fear's not, you know, the motive isn't was Diana pregnant, but the motive is there very loud and clear. She could have become pregnant at any time if she wasn't pregnant already. Yes, so well, that's true. Th that's course, really yeah, the point. But going back to the pregnancy, we did, uh, you know, we, we didn't really look into it too too much in our first book, but we, we, came, we, we, we received some information from someone who wanted to remain anonymous. It's not another, you know, one of those, I have got a name for you in a moment, but the initial information that pushed us towards this was wanted to remain anonymous. They said that he was a medical student and his tutor, Dr. Somebody or other, told him that his friend, uh, who turned out to be, we discovered, uh, Roderick Lane, a naturopath and Harley Street specialist, turned out it, it was Diana. She was Di he was Diana's um, well known, in fact, for becoming Diana's nutritional guru. Diana visited Roderick Lane just prior to her final holiday with Dodie Fayed because she feared she might be or she might become pregnant, and she wanted nutritional advice from Roderick Lane. She didn't want birth control. No, 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 no. He was a naturopath, and he was, he was okay. a nutritional guru. So, but she wanted advice that if she was if she was pregnant, um, she feared she 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 might be pregnant. I don't know what was going on, or you know, in terms of her periods or whatever. But she feared she was she was um, pregnant. So she went. This is what the information we received. So she went to see uh, this this character we'd never heard of. We did, in fact, in the end, track him down. And, um, and we phoned him up and interviewed him. And he was very cagey, uh, naturally, I suppose, uh, because we also discovered that after Diana's visit, his office in Harley Street was broken into and his computer equipment was stolen, never to be seen again. It's incredible how many break-ins there are, isn't it, isn't around it? this? Yeah, isn't it? Now, he denied that. So we followed up, I followed up by contacting someone I knew uh, who is a, quite a well-known investigative journalist in this, in this country, who is a, a friend of Roderick Lane's, uh, and he let it slip. Because I said to him, well, you know, this business about the computer then being stolen, you know, his office was broken into, and we know his computer was stolen, and the reply was, well, yes, but we don't think that was anything to do with Diana because we don't think she was killed anyway. So, so he the, corroborated yes, that. Yes, he corroborated the story, the yeah. And it's all computer. in the book there. As I said, we didn't really have the, the resources to follow this up because the doctor we needed to talk to had, had moved somewhere in, across Europe and et cetera, et cetera. So we put it in there. If Lord Stevens or Mohammed Al Fayed or anyone else who's got the resources to do it wants to follow this story up, there it is. Because, you know, it's not evidence, it's not smoking gun, but it's certainly 
information it's, that needs looking at. It's I leaning think. towards that direction that she was pregnant. But as yeah. you say, it wouldn't have mattered whether she was pregnant or not. If no. they wanted to kill her because of landmines and because she was messing up the royal family, yeah, for two reasons. Uh, I've got a question here. Dave in Bradford, was Diana pregnant with the child of Dodie or the Pakistani heart surgeon? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Either way, it would, it would appear to have been Dodie's, or the fear, the fear was that it would have been Dodie's, regardless of whose it was. Yeah, there's been another question or two about that with her, hasn't there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we won't go there. Um, so, she was embalmed. She was, illegally. Let's talk about that. Yeah, she was embalmed illegally. You're not allowed to embalm anyone in France without express permission of, of either the mayor of the city, the town, whatever. What's it got to do with the mayor? Well, you have to get their okay. approval, or the chief of police, or an immediate subordinate if the chief of police isn't available. None of those people gave, gave permission for Diana to be embalmed. In conjunction with that, you also have to have permission from someone who is authorised in terms of funerary uh, uh, arrangements, i.e. a close member of uh, Prince Charles, for example. But or, he was no longer a member of her family, was he, Prince Charles? He was still... He was still. Um, he was the father of her children. He was still apparently on the list of people that could have given authority to But her. why? I don't know. But because she was divorced, therefore she was a free agent and no longer a member of his family. Right, well, she was still the mother of his, his, his sons. Well, that's true. So, um, anyway, the point being that none of Diana's family, nor close relatives, nor close friends, nor anything to do with Diana, gave permission for her to be embalmed, we discovered, we found out. And the, neither the mayor, nor the chief of police, nor any subordinate in the French judiciary or legislative uh, system gave permission either. The order for Diana to be embalmed came expressly and specifically from a man called Keith Moss, who was the Consul General at the British Embassy at the time of Diana's death. In other words, you know, he was it. The, he was a diplomat. Yeah, the rumour was that it was actually Sir Michael Jay, who was actually the ambassador, who was like one above Keith Moss. So whether it actually came from him originally, we don't know. But what we do know is Keith Moss, specifically in the room, gave the order to the French uh, embalmer to embalm Diana. And he afterwards claimed that he made a mistake in translation. His French wasn't so good because... Uh, well, the Moss said this. Yes, yeah, this is the, this this. the consul-general in France, representing the British government in France. Who couldn't speak French. Couldn't speak French, yeah. Or, well... He... Well enough to explain, don't embalm her, just clean her up for people coming to uh, see her. So but that, she was embalmed. She was fully... Yeah, she was embalmed completely. And now, in order to embalm someone, you have to remove all their blood, don't you? She, so well, where, whatever you do, she was embalmed. Where did that go? Exactly. Where did it go? Where did it, all her personal belongings and effects go. We know, for example, Paul Burrell was, was uh, told by uh, one of Diana's close f friends. We've looked at those as well, some of Diana's closest friends and confidants uh, in the book. And one of them ordered Paul Burrell on his return to burn all of Diana's belongings. So none of them survived. They're, they're all, all the clothes she was wearing that night. This is, this is crucial forensic evidence. They were burned. Paul Burrell burned them himself on the orders of uh, this person. Which person? This so, Moss person? Sorry? Who was the person who ordered Paul Burrell? Yes, that's the name I can't remember, so you'll have to read the book, but it's in the book. OK. It's definitely in the book. <laughs> in the book. I didn't mean to embarrass you then, <laughs> no, John. No, 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 it's fine. All right, there are a lot so of names to remember. There was a briefcase, wasn't there, um, that was urgently taken from Paris to Balmoral, where the royal family was staying in the summer. And it was supposed to contain documents of some kind. Do you have any idea what was in that briefcase? No, we don't. That's and again, that... why would it be going to Well, Balmoral? why indeed did it go to Balmoral? And yeah. especially as Charles got on a plane that morning from mm -hmm. uh, Aberdeen Airport. Yeah, with a team of embalmers with him. He had a team of embalmers too, just, just, just in, case in case the, the French... French didn't get there first, yeah. So somebody yeah. wanted her embalmed. I was actually at the airport that morning. Were you really? And I was actually at Balmoral on the day she died, funnily enough. Isn't that wow. bizarre? Just outside. I wasn't invited in. <laughs> it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> but I was there, right. and I remember it very well. So um, let's talk about the ring. Dodi Fay had bought a ring at a high-class jeweller called Alberto Reposi. Mm -hmm. So it says here on my notes. 
Um, that was had a special name, didn't it? This ring, the Mwawi ring. Yeah, you tell me yes. Me. Tell me yes ring. It's a tell me yes range of very exclusive range. So if the if the oh. um, name of the ring is tell a plea yes. to tell me yes, <laughs> I've got to ask this. Yeah. What's the question? Yeah, exactly. Was she? Was she? You know, I mean, it seems to me that the ring was very definitely an engagement ring. Yes, whether. She would have accepted or not, who knows? But certainly the offer was there, wasn't it? The proposal was there. Tell me yes. It was a Dean one we And it was a very ring. expensive ring, wasn't it? About two hundred thousand pounds, I believe. Two hundred thousand pounds in nineteen ninety seven. A lot of money. So serious jewellery. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very serious, yeah. Yeah. And of course Diana said to journalists just a few days before, didn't she, when she was on the Jonical down in Sardinia that uh, you know, wait and see what I do next, what I do next or shock you, or worse to that effect. Yes. And there's a lot of speculation then, you know, uh, but of course once things turned rather sinister after her death, then of course, oh no, she didn't mean that, she didn't mean that, she didn't mean that. The, the Jonicle was the boat that Mohammed al yeah. had bought simply because she was going to spend some time with him and his wife. That's right, yeah. In Saint-Tropez. Yeah. And this is before she met Dodie, wasn't it? Because he was sort of introduced yeah, she, that's by right. yeah, 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 she, his yeah. father. Yeah. And of course they, they also, on, on route from the Bourget Airport, when they landed in Paris on that day, en route from the airport to the Ritz Hotel, they took a quite a very definite detour to, to the, the Windsor Windsor's Villa house. to yeah. look over their, what they, what they hoped, or what Dodi hoped probably would be their new home, away from all the, you know, the spotlight of the, of, of the media in, uh, in Britain. And this is sure. the house that the uh, abdicated mm. king and yeah, his it, American yeah. divorcee bride had That's lived right. in. In exile, if you like. That's right. Yeah. So. So it was getting a parallels bit. Parallels there, really. A lot, yeah, a lot mm. of parallels there. So, is it? Do you believe that she was pregnant? What I believe, Theo, is, is kind of, I, I try and see it as kind of irrelevant because when I get into this mode, what I'm trying to do is establish that she was assassinated. Now, I don't think her being pregnant or not is is necessarily a motive. I think the motive there is the fear that she could have been pregnant at any time. That, that's what I think. So that was just another was incentive, or not, was it? You know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And of course, the, f the fact that she was embalmed meant that uh, you know, the formaldehyde that they Would used... Would destroy to, any evidence of pregnancy right, and exactly. the hormones All the toxicological and yeah, tests. I'm going to read out a couple of texts here. This is from Jen. I believe she was murdered. Why does Diana's own family and sons want to side with the establishment? Surely they know and shouldn't approve. That's well, a good question, isn't it? It is a good question, but it's an extremely powerful est establishment, you know. Uh, it, it, a lot of her friends... I mean, I, 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 I... How can I say this? A lady called Simone Simmons, who uh, was one of Diana's close, close confidants, she said some things at the, at the uh, inquest that were out of place, and she's suffered since, uh, is my information. Uh, and uh, I think that a lot of the people who, you know, they live in this world, this, 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 this privileged, privileged world of, uh, the, this establishment is it's a massively powerful, privileged place to be. And to stand up and actually challenge it from within, it's, it's okay for someone like me, I suppose, who doesn't really belong to that, you know, world, but yeah. to challenge it from within would take a lot of courage. And, I think that is a big reason why a lot of people haven't and, and don't want to believe, they don't want to believe that no. uh, uh, she was murdered because it threatens their existence, it threatens their very privileged way of life. Okay. I think. Um, Paul in Warrington says, 7-7, seven, seven, no footage, 9-11, no footage. Well, I'm not sure about that, Paul. Mm. Diana's death, no footage. Coincidence? Question mark. I don't know. Well, there's, there's quite a bit of footage on that. <laughs> I think there's quite a footage. Yes. I don't think there's. I think some of the seven-seven footage is a bit dodgy, but yes, I see what you're coming, where you're coming from, yeah. Paul. Okay, so um, we've got eight or so <coughs> minutes to, to round up this very complex story. Um, on the one hand, we've got the official version of events that. Um, the chauffeur was drunk 
he had an accident running away from paparazzi at high speed in a tunnel and Diana was not killed immediately but died shortly afterwards because of the damage caused by the high speed collision to her heart. Um, and then we've got lots and lots and lots of other evidence which suggests that's not the case. I mean, how strong do you think the other evidence is? If you were to sort of say, on the one hand, you know, let's use Ocam's razor, the most likely explanation is the truth, isn't it, in most cases? The most likely, simplest explanation is the truth. Is it at all possible that the simplest explanation is the truth? And uh, against that, you know, we've got all this other stuff, of which there's a huge amount now, yeah. You know, all the break-ins, all the coincidences, all the people involved with MI6 and MI5 and, and so on and so on, and yeah. the evidence that we know about systems that are able to do these kind of things and so on, and the cars that disappeared and, and the money in his pocket and all that other stuff. You know, that's in the balance of probabilities. Yeah. You know, what do well, you think? Yeah, I agree. I think the simplest explanation is the truth. But I think the truth is she was assassinated. I don't think the truth is that it was an accident. I think the truth is she was assassinated. The reason there are so many different kind of ideas around it all still is because the truth has been whitewashed over and it's been replaced deliberately, in my opinion, by a whole lot of crazy stuff mixed in with some more credible stuff, mixed in with some very credible stuff. And it's all kind of been put out there and branded conspiracy theory, a little bit wacko, isn't it? Don't take it too seriously, you know, especially if you want to, you know, remain a, an upstanding citizen in the community, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the subliminal message going out all the time. If you really think Diana was murdered or, or whatever other conspiracy theory you might subscribe to, then, you know, there's something wrong with you, isn't there? And that is a very, very definite subliminal going out through the corporately controlled media that we have in this country for the most part. The except, establishment except here on except controversial media, TV. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, the establishment controlled media, you know. It very much is. It's, it's, it's very much uh, put, put that message out. And it's very difficult for, for some people to, to challenge that. But I think without complicating matters too much, if, when you really, really... You know, I went through that uh, for my sins I went through Lord Stevens' report, uh, Operation Paget report, which effectively became the coroner's report, with a tooth comb, more than once. And if people could be bothered to do that, I don't expect them to. I mean, it's a boring, laborious task in, in lots of ways. But you, you really do get to see just how that man presented the evidence and weighted it in favour of the accident theory, because the accident theory is all it is. It's, it's just only as un a theory. It's just as unproved as... It absolutely is, yeah. So you're I mean, saying don't the forget other... the inquest. The inquest did find that Diana died an uh, unlawful killing, but of course it wasn't like... Uh, it, was, it was a... It could have been on. a drunk driver, it could have been... Yeah, and okay. the pa or the paparazzi, yeah. Let's Let's get on to some other final subject here. This is a, a text from Carl from Reading. Has John received any threats or been warned off? Good luck, Carl from Reading. I can't say I've received any specific um, uh, physical threats and I don't really want to get too paranoid about one or two things that happened that possibly, but certainly... Like that helicopter, really. Like that helicopter, yeah. <laughs> certainly about getting the book published, that was very strange. We've been gagged is what's happened, Theo. We've been gagged. We've been silenced and, and, uh, and uh, you know, we had... Oh, there's so many stories to tell, but yes, the, the publication of the book was a problem getting the book uh, publicised when it came out. We had the Sunday Mirror chase John and I for months for our story. Mm. Months. They courted us, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, and eventually when the book came over, we said, OK, yes, it's going to be front page news, the story was going to shock the world. The Saturday night before it went out, it was pulled. And we got, we, we, we got a phone call saying, sorry, guys, we, there was a DA notice. Uh, Basically, this is the government. Ministry of Defence. Yes, that's right. Ministry of Defence, yeah, saying that our book couldn't be, couldn't be published. We did, I did an interview with James Whale on so his radio I'll, I'll, show. Let me, just, let me just backtrack you a bit here. Why would the Ministry of Defence say your book could not be serialised? Or... Because it compromised some, uh, he, they said, because it compromised the identity of so, some MI6 and MI5 agents and MI6 and MI5 operations. 
That's what they said. And the same thing happened on the James Wales show, which I was just about to say. We were interviewed yeah. live on James Wales. James had to say, sorry, guys. Because this is on the radio. He was, he, yeah. He had to curtail, not curtail the interview, but he had to uh, block out whole chunks of the book he wasn't allowed to refer to live on air. Now, we have also been on, you know, on Good Morning and GMTV and all of that, and it's been fine, but they're, they're very safe little programmes. Well, you get two minutes, don't you? Yeah, and you're not going to be allowed to say too much on those programmes. So, so what clothes was like Diana that. wearing? Yeah. <laughs> So all things, things like that, really. More, more, more. Uh, the magazine I was working on went down. The distributor pulled the plug. Within, I don't know, three or four months of, of the accident, suddenly we were out of work for no apparent reason. And it was selling well at that time, was it? Doing very well, yeah. Doing very well. So, and the wholesaler in America on the hardback book suddenly crashed, and we we lost. Not that I'm worried about that particularly, but well, <laughs> we lost an awful lot of uh, royalties because of that. That's what our publisher Royalties. says anyway. That's, that's an interesting says. word, isn't it? Royalties, in connection yeah. with Royalties. Well, we haven't, we haven't made many, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not particularly royal. OK. So any other incidents that have happened? Uh, oh, my goodness. Well, too many to mention, really, but the, uh, the, the one thing we did learn very, really quite recently, I suppose, towards back end of getting preparing this, this, this paperback edition, was uh, we, we were kind of whispered in our ear and someone said, uh, well, someone we know is very well placed, who gave us a lot of information in the first instance. Uh -huh. You know, we think you've been set up, is what they said. We think you've been set up. Uh, you've done very well. You've got this out. I think you've been more tenacious and, and dogged and determined than they expected you to be. But we, they, we, they think that we've been set up because we've got some good credible evidence out there. But because it all comes under the... Th conspiracy theorists brand if you like it's all up there uploaded on the internet next to some of what I consider to be the more crazy theories I don't mean that in a demeaning way at all I mean people believe what they believe and there may be some credibility some of the it. let's call them less likely theories okay actually. less likely theories yeah but some of them are particularly crazy deliberately and I know for sure that some well, of those disinformation yes they are disinformation exactly that yeah you've got so, five seconds well, that's, that's it, really. I think Diana was assassinated by the Boston Brakes.